Good morning, everyone. You know, back in 2016, I did um, one of the hardest bike races I've ever done. Uh, I know you all know that I like to race bikes, but mountain bikes in particular. And this one was a mountain bike race. It was 62 miles down in Mohican State Park. And so it's an off-road mountain bike race. And you have to navigate through single track, you know, these paths that are this wide. You navigate over rocks and over stumps and trees and holes and all these different obstacles. And in this race in particular, you had to navigate your way also through about 700 other mountain bikers, all trying to compete in this race. And about 45 miles into this race, I was going down a small hill, and my front wheel hit a rock, and I did what's called an endover. All right, that's where this end comes over this end. All right, endover. And so I did an endover, and I land on some rocks on the side of the trail on my ribs, and I ended up cracking my ribs. But for the next 17 miles, then I had to navigate through pain with every breath that I took, up hills and around, and at times it was frustrating, and at times I wanted to quit. And yesterday I was down at a mountain bike race in uh, Mohican watching, observing, and it just reminded me, you know, that, that sometimes it's the same way life is. You know, sometimes we got to navigate through work. we got to navigate through our careers. We have to navigate through our friendships. we got to navigate through family. We have to navigate through some tough times in life, and sometimes you just feel like, just feel like giving up. But the Bible has a word to describe a person who, who navigates life well. And the word that is used to describe a person that navigates life well is wise. Wise. You see, a person can have a lot of knowledge, but have no wisdom. And it's not the goal of the Bible to teach us just knowledge. The Bible isn't just given to us to fill us with information. The Bible wasn't preserved for us to just give us a bunch of information. It was given to us so that we would take the Bible, we would then apply it to our lives, and and we would use that wisdom, the biblical truth, this wisdom that it gives us, and and it would teach us to to live lives that were transformed, to live lives that were different. So for the next six weeks, we are going to journey through some of the Proverbs. We're going to walk through the Proverbs and, and look at this book of Proverbs and strive to better live as wise, faithful followers of Jesus. Now, Proverbs applies God's truth to our lives in very practical ways. Now, in recent years, that word application has kind of taken on, well, a whole new meaning, and it's become quite popular, the word application. However... We've shortened the word. And if you have a smartphone, you know what I'm talking about. It's not application anymore. What is it? It's an app. There's an app for that, right? I mean, it's like yesterday. I was down at this mountain bike race, and, and the start happened, and the guys were out there racing for quite a while. So me and one of the other buddies from a mountain bike club went for a walk along the river, and we started talking about birds. And there was one we couldn't identify, and he goes, I got an app for that. And he pulls up this app called iBird. And we identified the bird through his app called iBird. So there's an app on your phone. You can find an app for just about anything that you want to find. Some of them are free. Some of them cost 99 cents. That one I thought, well, that's cool. I'll put it on my phone too. $14.99. I said, no, I won't. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm too cheap for that. All right, but there's an app. Some of my favorite apps, one is Yelp. All right, so when I'm traveling out of town, Heidi and I, we don't like to eat at Bob Evans and O'Charlie's and, you know, Applebee's, the chain restaurants. We like to find the local joints. So I'll use it, Yelp. We want pizza. I'm going to look at Yelp reviews. Who's got the best pizza in town? You know, so that, I use that one quite a bit. Another one that I like is Gas Buddy. All right, so that'll tell you the, the cheapest price or the prices for gas within about a 10-mile radius. You can look up and say, oh, okay, here's where I'm going to get gas. It's cheaper over here. Another one that um, I really like that I just discovered is Shazam. Anyone got Shazam? Anyone? No one's got Shazam? All right. I just found this one. I'm not real good with music, you know, and my friends, you know, they're like, we used to get together, and they'd be playing the classic rock, and, you know, it's, okay, name that song. Name that artist. And I'm like, I don't have a clue. You know, I, I, I lose at that game all the time. Well, Shazam 
If you hear a song on the radio you like or playing somewhere that you like, you hit the button on Shazam, it listens to it for like two to five seconds, and it will tell you the name of the song and who the artist is. I mean, it's incredible. It's, I, I tried it. I mean, I've tried it on Christian music and everything. It works every time. I'm like, how does it do that? How does it do that? So now you're interested in Shazam. By the way, it's free. Do me one favor, though. Never do it while I'm preaching. All right? <laughs> Because it's going to come back and go, 1998, Billy Graham. All right, I mean, you know, and, and I don't want you to know where I get my material from. All right, so I'm just kidding, I don't. But, but I'm very excited about this series that we're heading into, looking into the book of Proverbs called an app for that. And I want to encourage you to make some applications. As we go through this series, as we look at the book of Proverbs, how can you apply these Proverbs to your life? and begin to download these Proverbs into your own life over the next month and a half. Now, let me give you a little background. This this is what this sermon's on this morning. It's kind of an introduction to Proverbs, but let me give you a little background about Proverbs. Some things you need to know. The book of Proverbs was written around 900 B.C. Okay, 900 B.C., so it's nearly 3,000 years old, and yet (laughs) these Proverbs are still applicable to us today. They apply to our lives today. Now, the author is primarily Solomon. All right, so there are a few other authors in there. Solomon throws them in there, but probably 95% of the writings are Solomon. There are 915 different Proverbs. All right, and we're going to spend six weeks on this series, so I'm going to touch probably 40 to 50 of those 915 Proverbs as we go throughout this study for the next six weeks. So so let me begin by explaining that every proverb has three very distinct vital components to it. First of all, every proverb is a timeless truth. It's not temporary advice. It is a timeless truth. Now that's important for us to know because you need to understand that this is not just a quick fix, all right? This is something that is ongoing. These Proverbs will help you throughout time. They are going to carry you on and on and on. Any proverb is like that, whether it's a biblical proverb or there are some good secular proverbs as well. So I want you to start learning these Proverbs. I want you to start maybe memorizing some of these Proverbs. And I know right away you use that word memorize and people go, I can't memorize Yes, you can, and I'm going to prove it, all right? I'm going to give you some secular Proverbs, and I want you to finish them for me. I'm going to give you the first part of the proverb. You finish the rest of the proverb for me, okay? These, these are secular Proverbs. Here we go. Ready, everybody ready? Okay. Look before you. Good. A penny saved? All right. The apple doesn't? Can't teach an old dog? Two heads? <laughs> You all should go on Jeopardy. I mean, you got the Proverbs category down, right? All right, maybe you're not quite good enough for Jeopardy, especially now with that James guy on there. But, but anyway, Proverbs, whether they are biblical or secular, they help us. Now, I want you to take out your Bible. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. It's important that you bring a Bible of some kind throughout this study, um, whether it's a, you know, paper Bible like this, or whether it's an app on your phone. The Bible app is great, by the way, if you don't have that, you know, or whatever you got for a Bible. Anyway, the book of Proverbs, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, use one of these right here in the pew. If you don't own a Bible, take it home with you. It's yours. It's free. You know, we want you to have a Bible. But if you don't know how to find the book of Proverbs, the easiest thing to do is go directly to the middle of the Bible. When you open it up, you're going to come to either Psalms or Proverbs. And I hit Proverbs this time. So, you know, if you hit Psalms, you want to go a little bit to the right, you're in the book of Proverbs. But that's the easiest way to find Proverbs. Just go right to the middle of your Bible. You'll almost always hit Psalms or Proverbs. All right, so uh, Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22 today. Well, we're going to go back to Proverbs 1. So just keep Proverbs open the whole morning. All right, Proverbs 22 is where we're going to start because here's what I want you to see when we talk about these timeless principles. In Proverbs 22, there's some good examples, some some Proverbs that are still stand true 3,000 years after they have been written. And they they can benefit the way we approach everyday life. So Proverbs 22, verse 6, here's what it says. 
Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Now, that's a timeless truth. It's practical advice for parents. It's short, it's sweet, it is a principle that works. Now, look at Proverbs 22, verse 7. One verse later. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Again, what a timeless truth. All right? that, that proverb from 3,000 years ago still applies to us today. It's very appropriate. You know, I pay my credit card off every month. My spending is within my means. You know, I, I work at saving money every paycheck. But not such the case several years ago. You know, I had a friend who called me up one day. He was a financial advisor. Wes, you need to buy this stock. It's a hot stock. You need to buy it now. And I'm like, I don't have any money. Take money off your credit card. I'm telling you, you're going to make money off this stock. I took his advice. <laughs> and then a year like 2008 hit. And Wes became slave to the lender. And it took a while to not be a slave to that lender anymore. And maybe for some of you, you've experienced the same thing, where you've gotten in trouble with credit cards, and you know, Solomon's words stand true, that the borrower is slave to the lender. So, so why don't we look at these Proverbs? What if, what if we really believed what Solomon writes? What if we actually put it into practice? Would there be less arguments in our home? Would there be less stress in our life? Would, would, would generosity come more naturally if we downloaded the proverb apps into our life? Here's a second vital component that you need to understand about each proverb. It's a general principle, not an unconditional promise. It's a general principle, not an unconditional promise. Now let me give you an example of this. Look back at Proverbs 22 again. Look back at verse 6 there, the one we just talked about. And I want you to see this, not so much as a promise from God, but a principles of God. Verse 6 says, start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Now, some of you may have that memorized by the King James Version. The King James Version is train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, here's the thing. Nine out of ten times, that's true. 95 out of 100 kids, yes, that is going to be true for, you know, 95 out of 100. But understand, there are exceptions to the rule. And that's why they are principles and not unconditional promises. Why? Well, because free will. You see, we throw humans free will into the mix, and a person might choose to go in a totally different direction than the way their parents raised them in church. And so they are principles, not necessarily unconditional promises. Here's a third thing you need to understand about a proverb. It's a specific information that has a broad application. So it's specific information, but it has a broad application. In other words, these principles can be taught in the business world. They apply to your businesses. They can be taught in the high school classroom. They apply to high schoolers. You know, they, they can be taught in budgeting seminars. These applications stretch beyond the sanctuary setting. For example, the borrower is slave to the lender. That applies whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, right? So these proverbs are both morally and ethically sound for everyone. And when we study these principles, they give us a glimpse into God's character and what's important to him. David McKinley is a Baptist preacher down in Augusta, Georgia, and he did a series on proverbs some time ago, and, and I heard uh, some of his sermon. And what he said in one of his sermons is this. He said, there is a sense today that we are living in an age where we are exploding with information and knowledge, but so many people are struggling to have wisdom to live life. He says, we are drowning in information, but starving for knowledge and wisdom. What an accurate picture that is of our world. And Solomon's words are what we need to hear today. These proverbs are so valuable to us. Now, understand how Solomon became the wisest man. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 3, it tells us how Solomon got his wisdom. Now, here's the setting. Israel is at its highest point. It's a time of peace. It's a time of, of financial prosperity, economic prosperity in Israel. And the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream, and he says to Solomon, he says, ask for whatever you want. 
ask whatever it is that you want, and I will give it to you. Now, if God did that to us, I'd be going, I'll take some of that financial freedom. You know, I, I mean, I'll take some long life. I'll take some great wealth. I'll take a powerful army. But that wasn't the case for Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 7 and 9, here's what Solomon replies. He says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a child and do not know how to carry out my duties. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? What's he asked for? He asked for wisdom. He asked for discernment. And because he asked for that, God granted him a discerning and wise heart. And because he didn't ask for those other things, God went, you know what? Bonus, you're getting some of those other things as well. And Solomon shows his wisdom in his governance, you know, of Israel time and time again. Now, flip back to Proverbs chapter 1, since we're starting a study on Proverbs today. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to look at the opening verses of Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I like to hear pages in the Bible going. That's pretty cool. Verses 1 and 5. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. So that's up there on the screen. So if you want to look up on the screen real quick here, look, look at those words that are in bold. Wisdom, instruction, prudence, knowledge, discretion, discerning. That's what the Proverbs are about. As a matter of fact, in the Proverbs, 125 times it mentions wisdom. You see, Proverbs were written from a father to a son. And you don't want to have a child who knows things, and that's all they do. You want a child who knows things, but then can apply those things in their lives. So this is fatherly advice for all of us, and we need to learn these Proverbs. The foundation of wisdom is found in Proverbs 1.7. Look at 1.7, because it all comes down to this. This is the focus. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Have you ever been around someone who, who doesn't want instruction? If you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right? you, you try to tell a teenager, oh, here's what you need to do, you need to do this. I know, I know, I know. I got it. And then they go on to prove and do something and they show that they don't got it. Well, he says this, he says, foolish person despises wisdom and instruction. Proverbs, Proverbs teaches us to hunger for that wisdom. He says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or the beginning of knowledge. Well, what does that mean? Well, there should be a healthy respect. There should be a reverence for God and his power. There's an acknowledgement that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, that the world revolves around God. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the world revolves because of God. And the Christian life begins by dying to self on a daily basis and looking at things like Proverbs and learning from God how to live for God. Now, the New Testament equivalent to this fear God would come from Jesus' words, Matthew 10, 28, 10, 28, where Jesus says this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, fear God. Sometimes that concept of fearing God is confusing to Christians. We say, well, are we supposed to be terrified of God? I mean, does, I don't understand. Is it? How do you balance the fact that God is, is loving and, and we're supposed to love God? Well, while this is fall, fails in comparison for a lot of people, you need to compare it to a good, godly, earthly father. A, a good, godly, earthly father who is firm and yet is fair. At, at times he is feared, but he is still loved. His children have an acknowledgement of his power, but yet there's a healthy fear and acknowledgement of who he is 
and what authority he has and what he can do. I I think C.S. Lewis gave one of the best understandings of how to fear God in his children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia. In In those children's books, Aslan is the lion, Aslan is the hero, you know, of the books. Aslan represents Jesus. And one of the books early on, one of the kids asks about Aslan. They say, you know, they're all drawn to Aslan, I mean, but they also fear Aslan because, I mean, he's a lion. He could rip them from limb to limb. But one of the kids asks, they said, is he safe? And I love the response. The response is, no, he's not safe, but he is good. And that is a perfect picture of God the Father. He can be a God of wrath, but he is a good God. He is a fair God. He is a forgiving God. And the book of Proverbs teaches us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It wasn't until my late 20s that I actually read through the book of Proverbs. And the reason it happened then, I remember that, is because I was doing a youth series when I was a youth minister on the book of Proverbs. And I challenged the students. I said, read the corresponding chapter of Proverbs the corresponding day of the month for the next month, and you'll read through the book of Proverbs. Four to five minutes a day, and you read through the book of Proverbs. And so I was doing that along with them. And that's what I want to challenge you to do. Starting today, I want to challenge you to begin to read through the book of Proverbs. And so today is Cinco de Mayo. All right, it's the 5th of May, right? And so you're going to read Proverbs chapter 5. Tomorrow's May 6th. What chapter are you going to read? Six. Six. Yeah. You know, some of, some of you got it. I think some of you, you got to catch on a little bit, so let's try it again. So then on the next day, it'll be May 7th, and you're going to read chapter? Oh, now you're getting it. Okay, everybody's got it now. Good. So, you know, that's what you're going to do. And so I want to challenge you to do this as we go through this series, to read the corresponding with the chapters of the month. Fortunately, May has 31 days, so we'll get to read Proverbs chapter 31, since there are 31 Proverbs. All right, now you can do this on the computer, you can do this in your Bible, all right? There's also an app for that, all right? Put in the Bible app, it'll pull it up for you every day, it'll remind you, read Proverbs, whatever chapter it is. So you do that, but schedule some time every day to read the Proverbs. This should be on top of what you're already reading in the Bible, right? Okay, good. And what you're going to find is, you know, time and time again, you're going to be reminded, you're going to read things that maybe you read before, heard before, and you're going to see just how relevant God's Word is for us today. And if you're like me, I, I, when I do my Bible reading, I still read from a paper Bible, because I like to I know some of you don't appreciate writing in the Bible, but I do. I I like to underline. I like to make notes in the margin. I even have a journal that I keep beside me when I'm doing my daily quiet times, and I'll, you know, if a verse stands out to me, I'll write that verse in my journal and why it means something to me that day. You know, so, so do things like that. You know, make notations. Maybe start memorizing one or two of the Proverbs as you go through them, but find some way to download these Proverbs into your life. Billy Graham he used to say, he said, I read five psalms a day, and I would re- read one chapter of Proverbs each day. He said, that way, in the course of one month, I've read both books, and I can do that time and time again. But then he added this. He said, I read the psalms to keep me right with God. I read the Proverbs to keep me right with man. And that's what happens when we start to download God's wisdom into our lives. You see, Proverbs literally means the skill of living or the skill of navigating life well. You know, earlier I talked about navigating through a mountain bike race. You have to navigate your way through. And Proverbs helps us to navigate life, everyday life. Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. These verses in Proverbs tell us that our quest for wisdom, our, our, our quest for, you know, life's decisions, should begin by seeking wisdom from above. And the book of Proverbs has helped me probably more than any other book when it comes to overcoming temptation. Sometimes when I'm tempted to do something that I shouldn't do, I kind of, you know, I I play it out like Proverbs. So I say, well, if I give in to this temptation, what's it going to look like two years from now? Five years from now? Ten years from now? 
You know, so, you know, I'm tempted to do this sin. What, what's going what's to look like two, five, ten years down the road? You know, if I give in to the, my temptation to lose my temper, if I give in to the temptation to spout off to someone who's being critical, if I give in to the temptation to slack at work or to cheat or to steal or to cheat on their spouse, you know, how's that going to affect the long term? And as you read these short chapters, you're going to see that there are many proverbs that just apply to your life. Many of you are familiar with the name Charles Stanley. Uh, A lot of people know his son a little better now, Andy Stanley. But Charles Stanley is a preacher down in Atlanta, Georgia. And he said this. He said, when we face temptations from the evil one, we must remember the most important factor is CMD. CMD. The critical moment of decision. The critical moment of decision. And Stanley points out that you are strongest at the first point of attack. And if you don't stand up when that first point of attack happens, then you're probably going to be less likely to stand up when Satan comes at you with that battering ram later on as well. So if you don't react in a godly fashion at that first moment of attack, at that first point of attack, that critical moment of decision, the odds are in time you're either going to give up or you're going to give in. And he's right. There are critical junctions in our life when we are faced with the decision of honoring God or are we going to satisfy ourselves. And how you respond to those instances will dictate your progression or regression in your spiritual life. I don't know how many times I've heard a person say, I just didn't think it through. I just, you know, I just, I just didn't put a lot of thought to it. I just didn't think it through. And the book of Proverbs will help you think it through. Now, one of the most difficult things as we study Proverbs, as we read these words of wisdom, these Proverbs of wisdom, is to realize that the man who wrote these words, <laughs> the majority of them, was not always wise as his living as he was in his writings. And if you know Solomon, you know what I'm talking about. And understand, there is a difference in these sayings and applying them to your life. In fact, years later, Solomon would write another book called Ecclesiastes. And he would admit that a lot of the things that he strived for in life, a lot of the things that he went for to make himself happy, he says, it was all in vain. It was all vanity. It was all vanity. And he was right. Because he didn't always pursue the right thing. And without God blessing the things we're doing in our life, then it's all in vain. It's all vain. It's all meaningless. And like us, Solomon at times needed to say, you know what? Don't do as I do. Do as I say. And we all know that type of individual. I mean, it's it's the, you know, out of shape doctor that looks at you and says, you know, you really need to lose some weight and do some exercise. It's the marriage counselor who's been divorced four times. It's the preacher who tells you how you should wear your hair, you know, and, and, and he doesn't have any. It's the financial planner who asks you for a loan. It's the nutritionist who, you know, camps out at Taco Bell. You know, it's, it's, it's the elder who always goes to McDonald's. It's the king of, it's the, I don't know what that had to do with anything. I just wanted to throw it in there, all right? It's the king of Israel tells you where to find joy and fulfillment, and yet he looks everywhere else except to God. One of the best-known passages in Proverbs is Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. And I was reading this the other day, I was just going through some of the Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, most of you probably know this, and when I start saying it, you're going to know it, and I mean you're going to be able to repeat it by, you know, memorization, and, and you know it by heart. Verses three through six, or five through six, Proverbs three says this: Trust in the Lord with all your heart; lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways this says submit to Him. But in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. You got that right? Great verse, right? Why do we cut it off there? Because the other day I was looking at it. Look at verse seven. Because verse seven, I mean, it really brings the whole train of thought together. It completes it. Verse 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. You hear that last verse? Do not be wise in your own 
eyes. You see, the beginning of wisdom is having a reverence for God and realizing that he is all wisdom, that he is all knowing, and looking to him and seeking his direction, his guidance, his wisdom. Two weeks ago on Easter, we handed out these letters to everyone at the beginning of the service, and I asked you to do an exercise as we were going through the sermon, and then after the sermon, I asked you to open it up right before communion and read it, and it's a love letter from God. And, uh, you know, I received a lot of uh, compliments on the letter. A lot of people said they really enjoyed it. Several people told me it brought tears to their eyes. But I had one person tell me, you know, it, it brought tears to my eyes because it's the first love letter I ever got from God. That's the way they saw it. That's the way they heard it. And that's the way they understood it. But as I explained to him, and, and let me remind you, it was not the first love letter you ever got from God. This is the first one you've ever got. Right here. That was your second. And I want to challenge you this month to open up the book of Proverbs. And I want to challenge you to read it with the same intensity that you read that love letter on Easter Sunday morning. And to look at these Proverbs with fresh eyes. And to begin to see that this is a love letter to you that gives practical advice that you apply to your life, that you can make applications to in your everyday life as you strive to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are uh, so guilty at times of just setting aside time that, that just setting aside time that we, we don't set aside the time to pick up your love letter to us, your word. And, uh, we're all guilty of it, of not spending enough time in your word and, and just studying it. It's such practical advice, and your word is timeless. One of the ways we know it's from you is because these, these principles never end. They're as true today as they were 3,000 years ago. And we know that your word is it just it's so good. It, just, it teaches us every moment of every day. It, it can show us so many things. It can give us so much wisdom. Will you just help us to not just hear the word, but to, and not just read the word, but to take that word and, and apply it to our lives, to learn from your word. Not just to gain knowledge, but to gain wisdom. And to understand that what the knowledge we get from your word, we can apply it to our everyday lives and we can live it out for you. And so I just pray that you would help us to do that, to, to just dig in, to strive to love you more, to get into that love letter you've given us, and to just read it, to soak it in, and then to apply it. Thank you so much for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.